<laughs> yes, we're on right now, Joey. Go that didn't catch that. We didn't catch that part. Yeah, you can't curse. You oh, can't you curse. can cuss. Yeah, yeah. Tell them who's here, DB. Do I need to wear my headsets? Why not? Okay. The, yeah, I mean, if you'd like to, I mean, I'm going to do a little introduction for you because uh, a lot of people don't know that he starred in Tales from Put the Crypt. Put him under your chin. Well, how would it? Oh, okay. I'll oh. Ju- I look like a rabbi. Yeah, okay, let me see. Go ahead. There you go. Boom. You got it. There you go. <laughs> 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 Tell him who's here, DB. He's been here before, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even know how to top that, but I was going to say that he started Tales from the Crib from as Ulrich, uh, the the uh, was it Ulrich the Unstoppable or the uh, the Ulrich. It was Auric or Yurik, uh, the the Incredible. Yes, and, and, he, and, he, and he, had he had nine, nine lives. lives, and he couldn't die. He terrible, but he had a terrible. He was terrible at math. Right. Yes. So he thought he had. He thought he went through the nine, and his last one, he he died. Because um, he realized the cat had the used cat, it. And the cat, yeah, in the in the casket. Right. You know, he, he, he buried, buried himself. alive. Right. <laughs> the hell. The reason I brought that up because the man does have nine lives. He's been playing all types of characters. That's from- worse than dying. On Bad Boys 3. Oh! oh you want to go straight to he it? He spoiled it. I didn't say nothing. <laughs> what did I say? You said, come on, A lot man. of people die on Bad Joey Boys 3. Joey Pants is here, man. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. Give him a big I, round of applause, man. Thank you. You know, but, uh, you know it's funny because we had Joey Burke. First of all, uh, you were here about four or five years ago. I don't know if you recall. The studio was different. We were different. We were all, you know, younger. Um, wow. But we had... <laughs> Will Smith and, and Martin Lawrence on the show, and that, that's one of the things we asked them is why? Why did they kill off your character? And did Will say because he's producing and and I was too expensive? <laughs> is that what it was? I said, Will, if you're going to kill me off, there's a death tax. I said, I'll do it for this much money if you don't kill me. And uh, and he said, No, we appreciate you. I'll give you all the money to get you off. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I'm making this up. <laughs> I'm just flying with it. Yeah. No, no, it's like. Listen, I'm still hoping they'll bring me back. I got I already wrote the scene. Bad Boys for Life is the fourth <laughs> one, right. whatever right. they're going to call it. <laughs> and they come they come in and there is a big car chase like the first, last one mm-hmm. and they and they go to the hospital and I'm there and I got wires and tubes out of my nose and and they go cap it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we fooled them. I like that. Yeah. Hey, do they do a like a, a death party when they know a character is about to, you know, the the life is going to end on the show that they throw a they party? They used to do you? that. They used to do that uh with the Sopranos. Okay. Well, yeah, we did that and then uh, until I died and then they stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know was it me? <laughs> <laughs> Might have been you, man. Um <clears throat> Since you brought up the Sopranos, yeah, I never the the ending never sat well with me, man. I I never got it. I, it was too ambiguous for me. What what, what did you interpret? But that's from? but the ambiguity of it is very. You know, people still talk about it. If they spell it out for you, you got an answer. You know, it's not you're not inquisitive anymore. But I think I think it says more to David Chase's philosophy. I think David Chase said, "When you die, that's it. There ain't no heaven." Hmm. You just stop existing, mm-hmm. and I like uh, you know I like that. I mean, uh, you know, I think it, I think if humans weren't so afraid of death, that we'd all commit suicide a long time ago. Oh, well, no, come on, man! Animals, <laughs> other species have no understanding of their existence. What are you talking about? Which is, is I'm we're, telling we're you, we're conscious human beings, though. Like we're that's, thinking people. But that's that's a flaw in our DNA. Our consciousness. Uh, yeah, our inquisitiveness. Like, yeah. Why is the sky blue? Dogs don't give a shit. You know, ducks. Ducks don't go. Hey, you see a duck have a fight with another duck? They flap their wings and then they, they, you know, they just kind of go off. You, you don't see, you know, duck go. You see that? You see what that guy said to me? I'm never going to talk to that guy again. <laughs> well, you got to talk in here. Nice. What is that? You're talking to the dying. See what I mean? I'm I'm looking at y'all. <laughs> but Come you know, on. speaking of suicide, that's a good segue into this play, Drift the Play that Let's I'm doing. Talk about it. Over on 50th Street, right down the block at the New World Stages, because it's about a secret, a, a you know, untold truth. You know, uh, um, second generation Italian Americans, Irish Americans in the construction business, and uh, and the, and the result of the aftermath of a suicide that caused a murder, that caused imprisonment, and now it's all kind of coming to roost, and all of the traumatic pain that goes along with these unresolved feelings from family. Mm. Mental disease. Yeah, you played Tom McMillan, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, who was Tom? What is his? Tom play? was the partner. You know, a first generation. Um, 
during, you know, working within construction in Chicago, you know, generational uh, different different young um, um, first generation immigrants catching hot rivets when they were building the cross bridges on the river, like the Clark Street Bridge, and they'd have all these immigrant kids go in the water to get these rivets because the rivets were way more valuable than the kids. You know, they'd get a penny a dozen for the uh-huh. rivets, and then they bring them back up to the bridge and, and reuse them. Uh, and, and based on that, uh, the, the, the uh, patriarch's father, these three boys, and I started a company. When you meet the boy, he's just come back from a 10-year sentence for killing a man uh, in his rage that his father committed suicide. It's 1957, and, uh, and I'm still running the company, and their name is still on the company. Uh, and one of the brothers works for me, and uh, and he's coming back for a job. And we're building, we're building this big building, a thirty-story building in Chicago, um, and um, stuff is unresolved. Secrets are still told. Uh, mm-hmm. Resentments are still living. That's that's true. Like we see that in real life, you know, with families um, uh, where you have a lot of secrets unresolved pain that you see in families and they go generations and generations and generations. Did your family experience any of that? Oh yeah. I wrote a book about it. No mm-hmm. kidding. Uh, uh, I got an organization called no kidding me too, yeah. which deals with uh, unresolved uh, emotional disease and the, and the shame and stigma and bigotry that surrounds mental illness. Mm-hmm. If you have the flu, nobody says what's the matter with you. Snap out of it, get out of bed and get to work. But if you have uh, depression, they'll say it's you know it's all in your head. What are you doing? Come on, come on. You can you know you just have to change your attitude. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so uh, and and the studies. There's a great study by Dr. Nader- Dean Burke. There's a TED talk on on how childhood trauma between the ages of of birth and six years old store up unresolved, and they affect you physically and through cognitive therapies. You can reverse asthma. You can reverse cancer. You can you know through challenging these unresolved pains that live inside you you know a lot of a lot of people are are the, use their their desire to succeed mm-hmm. at, to medicate mm-hmm. you know but but being driven is is rewarded you know being a workaholic is is rewarded mm-hmm. and being an alcoholic isn't mm. So it's mm. interesting. Mm. So that's why I like I the play. That's why I wanted to do the play because it's at a point where people have no understanding. We have a, one of the boys is you know would possibly be he's a pianist. He's a classical pianist, sixteen years old, and uh, in our play, uh, but he, he's there's something different about him. But in '57, nobody knew what a spectrum was. They didn't know what right. autism was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, somebody was just different or slow. You know, like when I was in school, I was either That's stupid, right. lazy, or crazy. Uh-huh. They didn't know I had dyslexia. You know, I was yeah. born in 51. So, so they hadn't been diagnosed? They didn't diagnose that? I was only diagnosed when my 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 younger kids were diagnosed. I was 52 years old. Uh-huh. When Before I, you knew what it was. Yeah, but then but I had knew, it. Yeah. What, what was it like having it? Like. Well, I didn't learn how to read until I was 19. I did this, I, I did the senior class play in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, and the teacher came after with two of them, and they said, you know, you have an aptitude for this, but if you want to become an actor, you're going to need ha- to learn how to read. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be an actor because I figured I wouldn't have to study. You know, mm-hmm. I've been lying my whole life. Okay. So, <laughs> so you, do, yes. you get paid to pretend. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, uh, you know, at almost 19 years old, I was three months shy of 19 when I graduated high school. And uh, I went to get evaluated, and the teachers uh, said that I had an, a third grade reading level. But, mm. you know, most people, uh, 30% of Americans are functionally illiterate. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned how to type with texting with my iPhone. Now people are talking into it. You know, now that I know how to, you know, and then spell it. all that time out <laughs> to on. learn it, man, well, right? That, so right. You got your I wrote my time. first book because I had the technology caught up to me. <laughs> yeah. Right. My, my te- the technology caught up to my, my ignorance. Uh-huh. I, I just talk, I just <laughs> talked a book, you know, and magically <laughs> came into words. Do, do you think, y'all, I want to go back to, you made, you commented about people's um, drive to succeed and it's rewarded in the end. So do you think that that ambition is a, kind of an addiction? Yeah, it's all balanced out, isn't okay. it? Because it's un, it's insatiable, mm-hmm. you know. And 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 uh, and you got a reality star president that is being rewarded constantly by by forty percent of these have-nots that are resentful, are resentful, 
um, and 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 miss their opportunity. You know, they're all, all over fifty, and they see this celebrity as a kind of thing that you know I'm I can do that. When I was a kid, wanting to be an actor, people would say, "What are you crazy?" You can't be an actor. You're mm-hmm. not entitled. You're from Hoboken, New Jersey. But now it's celebrity. Somebody sees a reality show and they go, hey, I could do that. Mm-hmm. That's easy. You know, so on Bad Boys for Life, I, I uh, jokingly said that we kill a lot of people with high Instagram numbers. Mm. You know, because now it's not about talent. It's about yeah. how many Instagram numbers uh-huh. you have. You know, if you got 30 million Instagrams, yeah, you know, you, 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 they've never seen the inside of an acting class. Ooh, shoot, that's a point right there, uh, message right there. I think Joe just fired a shot off right yeah. there. And who did they kill? You. <laughs> the talented one. The actor. Yes. The actual actor. <laughs> Joe, would you mind sharing a bit about um, some addictions you may have gone through in your life and then the steps My seven take? deadly symptoms. <laughs> there we go. My first one was my eating disorder. So at, at 11 years old, I, I, I put on 100 pounds. By the time I hit puberty, I wanted to look like Tommy Mc, Mc, McCready. Mm-hmm. And I thought that, you know, because the girls liked him. So if I could lose the weight, then I found starvation as another because it was pumping up my my uh, dopamine serotonin levels, my, you know, the imbalance. So then food. Then I discovered masturbation, okay. meditation and medication. Uh, All and at so, once? Well, no. I, it took me a while to to get over the masturbation part. Oh, you know. <laughs> until I got busted in the subway. But uh, oh, yo. just kidding, just kidding. Oh. I'm very self-effacing here. Not for real. What train was it now? <laughs> the A train. Okay. <laughs> Long stops are very helpful. Uh, but uh, you know, so then and so then success. Success was number four, to be successful. If I could be successful, this feeling inside the pit of my soul would go away. And as I started succeeding, it didn't go away. Mm. So I needed more of it. And then as I became more successful, I discovered alcohol. I, dis- I stayed away from alcohol and drugs for a long time because I knew it would get in the way. I had a, I had a vision. I had a dream. Mm. And, uh, and so once the dream became true, that feeling was still inside me. I remember... When I won the Emmy Award, I was on stage, and I'm and my and my little you know that subconscious mind of mine was saying, "What's why do I still feel the same? This is supposed to make me feel better." And as I was walking off the stage, I had a, a epiphany. I said, "Well, that's because it's not an Academy Award. If it was an Academy Award, this feeling would go away." That's what you told yourself. Yeah. But that ain't necessarily true either, though. No, it would not. It's never enough. It's never enough. It's a big, big pit. Uh-huh. And so you learn to live with it. And not what I've learned is that my my depression, my my diseasiness, is uh, is a, a is a a gift, a creative gift that I can use to sublimate through mm. the characters that I play. Mm. Oh. So it's 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 the positive nature to what I do for a living, yeah. but it's hard to live with it. Right. What a pivot. What a last time you uh, masturbated. Uh, what day is today? This is uh, two Tuesday. hours ago. Two, two hours, hours ago. Okay. There you go. Healthy yeah, I, mean, he, man. I saw him in the bathroom two hours oh. ago. What the hell? <laughs> Joe, come on, man. Joe, can you also speak on? You said you were addicted to meditation. A lot of people would look at that as medicinal for healing other types of addiction. But it's you, it's you do it too much. It's like you know yoga. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, if you go to a twelve step meeting, I highly recommend twelve step. Even if you're ch- you know if you have a parent that's an alcoholic or drug abuser or a workaholic, they have these wonderful organizations where you can go and talk about yourself for a dollar a session and and, and hear other people talk about their diseasiness uh, but but you would find in like in Alcoholics Anonymous it's the sugar so you know people are you know, their brain desires the sugar so so when they stop drinking that takes 65 days to get that out of your brain system so people start eating chocolate so they go to the coffee and they 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 start hitting the donuts and so they they stop drinking but they put on 70 pounds or somebody goes and buys a pair of sneakers and they're running marathons within three months so it's it's like balance it's it's not the drinking it's the thinking it's what it's how we think about life and and wanting not to feel because Right now, you're looking at a TV set, and a commercial pops up and tells you you don't have to have wrinkles, you don't have right. to have this, you don't have to have skin like that. You know, your, your, your phone, you can have a better, better connection with a different telephone. <laughs> it's it's all about advertising. That advertising controls us. It tells mm-hmm. us it works a thousand percent of the time. 
Wow. I, I wanted to bring up, um, because I'm sure you're aware, we just lost James Lipton, and you attended the HB studio when you were studying when I was how a to kid, be an yeah, actor. Yeah. Um, same studio as Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Gene Wilder, so many other people. And we just had Norman Reedus here last week who said he got into acting because he got drunk, got into an argument at a bar, and somebody said, You should be an actor. <laughs> and stories like that are great to hear, but he also went to a school afterwards because of the advice of that person. Right. So, you know, when you're doing Broadway, which is one of those things that you just can't fake, like you really need to do the work in order to to perform on that level how important wait, 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 is his it his phone is ringing uh -oh. okay. uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but how important is it to go to these acting courses in these studios in these schools in order to really hone your craft i think it's very important it's a foundation if you have an, an innate talent um that talent's going to work for you but you know when you're doing eight shows a week sometimes well i would say at, at eight, eight shows a week you know uh two shows where the, the inspirational gods will visit you but a lot of times you just got to got to fake it you got to create the moments so that the audience feels a lot of people think that if they're feeling that's acting it's about the the lady in the third row in the blue hat you got to make them laugh you got to make them feel if you, you if your audience is responding it's great um when i went to hb studios and now why i wanted to be in show business is i wanted to prove to a lot of people that i wasn't a piece of shit it was i'm going to show them right. i'll show them that that I'm not what I thought they were. And it was all projection. It was always what I thought they were. It was uh -huh. insecurity. Mm. Uh, and I think there's a lot of that. And you, that's why you see so many you know, artists that finally get what they've worked for their whole life, and then they, they die. Mm. You know, they OD, or they commit suicide. Uh -huh. Because that hole is never filled. And they go, I th thought this was going to make me feel better. And then they check out. Mm. Damn, Joey Pan. And you go back. I mean, go back to you go back to Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Cliff to to presently. Yeah, you know, you see it all the time. Now Heather is from Jersey too. Last time you came here, y'all were talking about some business transactions. Yeah, Heather B. What zip code? What exit? Oh, Jersey City. Hey, I'm Hoboken. I know. This is what I love. And we you guys always beat us in the fights because you had the high ground. <laughs> yeah, well, we were talking about how you lucked out because I don't know if you remember, but you shared with us that for some random reason you bought property in Hoboken, like an apartment. Did you keep no, your apartment? I, no, it's rent control. Oh. <laughs> no, that apartment cost me hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but I, I'm a project boy. We lived, we lived at 310 Jackson Street. We were on welfare. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. You say that with pride, right. too. Like, I am like, proud. You know. you know, the projects was the most diverse community in yes. the world because uh -huh. the one thing we all had in common was we were broke. Yeah. Everybody was poor. Uh -huh. And so what separated us was character. Mm. If somebody borrowed a dollar from you and they paid you back, you knew. And if they weren't <laughs> going to pay uh -huh. you back, it only cost you a dollar to find out they were a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yo, that's the greatest piece of advice I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that's real. Yeah, so it's rent control. He said it was rent, rent control. control. No. When I when I when I when I made when I when I made my first money, some a friend of mine, stranger, I mean he was a friend of mine, but I hadn't seen him in a while. He said, "Hey Joe, can you lend me fifty thousand dollars?" I'm on the phone. I said, "Are you crazy?" I said, "Mickey, we're good friends. I, what happens if you don't pay me back? Right. Then we won't be friends anymore." If you said, "Joey, let me fifteen hundred, that's a different story. He says, "All right, let me fifteen hundred." <laughs> 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 so wait, the, do you still have the place in Hoboken? Uh huh. Okay. All right. Yeah. I remember you told us a great story about how your dad was a hearse driver. Across the street from where I live, uh, yeah. Fiella's Memorial Home. He worked there forever. Yeah, and he used to take the suits. When he, uh, oh yeah, off the, off the, off the <laughs> <laughs> he he'd have to pick up bodies. Body. Hoboken's a small town. He knew yeah. everybody, yeah. so he'd go in and see the wife. He'd go, "Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry about Gus. Gus was a good guy. You know, he was friendly. He was generous. He was a forty regular." <laughs> <laughs> wow. What are you gonna do? And he would always wear dead people's clothing. My father would take their clothes, no. and I said, "Nice suit, Dad." He goes, "Yeah, you know, you know, Mickey Mulvaney." Yeah, he died. <laughs> this is his. Oh. Sway, so, hey, I gotta take you. Next time you come to Jersey, I'm gonna bring you to Hoboken. Like, it's I don't want a suit, Heather. No, 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 not for a suit. But it's a. It was a place where, like he's mentioned it, it had projects. It's unaffordable now. Like yeah. people cannot yeah. afford to live in Hoboken, no New Jersey. More. Yeah. No really? more. It's craziness. And it's also, crazy. you got to take them to Fiori's. 
Uh-huh. Fury's is on on uh, Fifth and Adam. It's uh, mozzarella. They make homemade mozzarella. Oh, yeah. They still make their sandwiches on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's it's sausage and mutz. On Mondays and Wednesdays, it's it's roast beef and mutz. And on Fridays, it's tuna fish because when you were Catholic, you couldn't eat, eat meat. meat on so they yeah. have the mayonnaise base or the Italian olive oil. She knows. Mm-hmm. I was raised Catholic. You walk, was down, raised the, Catholic. You walk down the, yeah. ro- the the bridge from Ho- Jersey City and take the uh, the short rail. Well, the the path train um, right over there. Yeah. So I was in. So you go like, to Journal Square. Yeah. Well, I grew up. Well, when I got my first apartment, I was downtown Jersey City on Grove. Street. Yeah, Grove so Street. It was. It's literally the, walk through that's the Newport an exit Mall. There. Yeah, yeah, it's right there. So it's it's the, quick. The, the, the Queen, ten- Queen. She's from Queen Jersey Latifah, City. She's from Newark, but she ended up moving to Jersey City. We were neighbors. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So. Black folks and, and so Italians. So they pay you good here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here. I can't, I can't deal with the two of them. Yo, Joe, you gonna get, what are you doing? No, no, <laughs> he's, trying to, a new he's, trying, yeah, he's trying to kill me off. He yeah, you to me. <laughs> Misery <laughs> loves company. <laughs> Pay you good here, man. Give it up for Joey Pants, ladies. And gentlemen. <laughs> Yo, man, make sure you guys check it out on the players running uh, right now, right? Yeah, it, it, it's in it, previews, it, and uh, and uh, you know, come come on over. It's eight shows a week. New World Stages. Wow. It's at three forty West Fiftieth Street between eighth and ninth. Literally, literally right down the street. So if you if you're visiting town. You want to see a great play, at least a great actor. I haven't watched the play yet, but I'm sure it's great if you're in it. Yeah. All right. And then also um, by the award, Academy Award winning um, director. That's the director. That's right, Bobby Moresco. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Million Dollar Baby, uh, Crash. Yeah. Two, two great movies. And uh, and and I and we've known each other for 45 years. We you know we did oh, our wow. first. We got our Screen Actors Guild card together uh, when we were 21 wow. years old. Wow. Wow. 21 plus 45. That's 66. Man, you're looking good, dog. I'm 68. 68? Yeah. Wow. You look amazing, bro. Black do don't you? crack. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, Joey Pans. All right. <laughs> we got... Black.